All right, so we are in a new series that we started last week. We're calling it Home for Christmas. Pastor Dale was here. He did a great job kicking us off in our series. And what we're doing in this sermon series is we're looking at John 1.14, which many theologians say is the most important verse in all of the Bible. I respectfully disagree with Tim Tebow. It's not just John 3.16 on his eye black. That's the most important verse in the Bible. It's John 114, which is going to be on the screen. It's our memory verse for the sermon series. So let me just commend you. If you have yet to memorize a passage of scripture this year from any of our sermon series, this is the one to do. This is the one to try and to write on the walls of your heart. John 114, the most important verse in all of the Bible, the verse of the Bible that distinguishes Christianity from every other world religion the world has ever seen. This is what makes Jesus and us different. It's John 1, 14. So you guys are going to read it on the screen. I've already memorized it, so I'm going to try to recite it from memory. Hopefully I don't embarrass myself in public. Okay, ready and go. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. It's very good. Make sure you do that. Now, our particular passage for today that we're looking at comes from the Gospel of Matthew. So if your Bibles, go ahead and open them up now. It doesn't matter if you have pages or pixels on your phone. Just go ahead and open it up wherever you're at. A little bit of background here. Uh, Matthew is one of the four Gospels of Jesus, the four ancient biographies of his life. So if you know them, say them with me. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Interestingly enough, it's only Matthew and Luke that have information about Jesus' life before his public ministry began. Neither Mark nor John talk about anything before Jesus' public ministry. But it's Matthew, or yeah, Mark and John don't. Matthew and Luke are the only ones that talk about Jesus' birth, about Jesus' childhood, about Jesus' family of origin. They're the only ones that do that. Um, I didn't realize it until earlier this year uh, in our study preparing for the sermon series Matthew is predominantly from the perspective of Jesus' earthly adopted father, Joseph. It's the story of Joseph's dreams, of angels appearing to Joseph, of the decisions that Joseph makes for him and his family. And conversely, in Luke, it's predominantly about Mary, the mother of Jesus, about angels that appear to her and prayers that she prays and about her family and what's going on with them. Matthew's from the dad's perspective. Luke is from the mom's perspective. Matthew is significantly shorter. There's only seven verses really about the birth of Jesus. And in Luke, there's about 152 verses, which makes perfect sense. Because if you ask a husband and wife to tell the story of the same event, one's going to be, oh, you get what I'm saying. I'm just not even going to go into that. All righty. So we are in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Let's look at the scriptures together. This is Joseph's story here. Verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. Messiah is a Hebrew word meaning the anointed one. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Pause right there. We read in John 1.14 that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Now notice here with Joseph, his characteristics. See, Jesus, even though he was fully God, 100% God incarnate, God in human flesh, he was also 100% God and 100% human. And he had to learn things from his parents. And like any of us, we take on characteristic traits of our parents. And Joseph raised Jesus in a home that went to temple, that knew the law of the Lord, and had a disposition of grace and truth. Because notice here, Joseph was a man who was faithful to the law. He loved the truth. And he did not want to publicly expose Mary to disgrace. Man, that's graceful. Even though she had supposedly made a sinful choice, or at least he thought she had, he didn't want to ruin her life. Joseph was full of grace and truth. I bet Jesus picked up on this from Joseph. So this is a good man here we can learn from. Verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid 
to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Praise God for that verse. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and then he gave him the name Jesus. This is the word of God for us today. Thanks be to God. So the title of today's message is All is Calm, All is Bright. Would you pray with me? Lord, I confess to you that I am not enough as a vessel of your truth and your message and your word to communicate to what these people need to hear today. But your Holy Spirit is enough. So Spirit of the living God, we acknowledge your presence here in this room. Come and move in great power. Speak to our hearts. Change our lives. Lord, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. I pray you would meet us exactly where we're at here today and give us exactly what we need from you in the exact way we need to hear it. Get me out of the way. And Holy Spirit, do what only you could do and work a miracle in this room now. Lord, we love you too. It's in your name we pray. In Jesus, in Jesus' name we said, we prayed. Amen. Amen. Whew, I got caught up there. I couldn't talk at the end. And the, the Jesus thing, we like you. Amen. <laughs> so last week, we kicked off our sermon series, Home for Christmas. And we started talking about the famous Christmas song, I'll Be Home for Christmas, that was sung by Bing Crosby. And we're going to talk this morning about another fav- famous and favorite Christmas carol, Silent Night. Who here loves Silent Night? Lots of people. It's a wonderful, classic Christmas carol Christmas song. It was written in 1818 by two men in a small village in the middle of Austria, and it got translated to English and has spread all over the known world to all sorts of different languages. It's a beautiful, beautiful song, and God is all over it. Um, Interestingly enough, Silent Night was recorded as well by Bing Crosby. And did you know this, that Silent Night, Bing Crosby's single of it, is the third best-selling single of all time. Not third best Christmas song of all time, third best selling single ever with 33 million units sold. It's only beaten by number two, A Candle in the Wind by Elton John. (laughs) And number one, White Christmas by Bing Crosby again. Apparently he did well for himself in his career. Good job. Uh, So it's a famous song. And if you've ever sung it before, it has this evocative power to it, does it not? We sing it here during our Christmas services where we all light candles and we lift them up and we sing silent night, holy night. And there's something just warm happens inside of you. It's peaceful here in this room, is it not? There's something powerful with this song. How many of you know country star Travis Tritt? Any of you know Travis Tritt? Y'all learn locks of hatch. You better know this stuff, okay? <laughs> Well, Travis Tripp, many years ago, um, he jokes about and he talks about how for many years before he made it big, he would play middle of nowhere joints before he hit it big in the music industry. And he reports that uh, many bars were dangerous places because, go figure, many drunk fans started fights over the smallest matters. Like, you didn't say that about my dog or my truck and, you know, all that stuff. So that was funnier, guys. Come on. Okay. (laughs) Apparently not. So Travis Tripp. He found a unique way, when all these bar fights were breaking out, he found a unique way to calm everybody down. He says this, silent night proved to be my all-time lifesaver. Just when bar fights started to get out of hand, when bikers were reaching for their pool cues and good old boys were headed for the gun racks, I'd start playing silent night. It could be the middle of July. I didn't care. Sometimes they would even start crying, standing there watching me sweat and play Christmas carols. Can you believe that? So cheers to Silent Night. It's a wonderful song. 
So let me just refresh your memory with some of the lyrics. We're going to put them on the screen. We're not going to sing it. We did singing last week. If you want to sing this, come to Christmas Candlelight. But hear the lyrics. It's silent night, holy night, all is calm, and all is bright. Some of you want to sing it. I can just hear you. (laughs) Round young virgin, mother and child, holy infant, so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. Christ the Savior is born. Christ the Savior is born. Now, I want to show you something. Now, Tom is back there helping me with slides. Everybody thank Tom and Dylan and the whole team back there. Can we thank them and honor them? So, Tom, go to the first verse if you wouldn't mind. Silent night, holy night, all is calm and all is bright. Um, I have two kids, <laughs> and I was there when my wife had my kids, and let me just tell you, it is not all calm, <laughs> and it is not all bright. Fellas, can I get an amen? Yeah, amen. It is not exactly that. All is not calm, and all is not necessarily bright. I know, I'm not trying to, you know, throw shade on this song. It's an awesome song. We're going to sing it. But there's some parts where like, that's not realistic, man. Are you kidding me? What baby are you talking about? That's crazy. No, but here's what's interesting. Surely it was probably not all as calm and all as bright in a manger in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. But I guarantee you all was not calm and it was not bright for Joseph in his life. Think about this. Imagine what it must have been like for Joseph finding out that his fiance was pregnant and not by him. So you thought you're reading the Bible, but it reads like a reality TV show, does it not? Imagine having to be the person who shares with Joseph the bad news. Your person has to come, um, hey, um, hey, Joe, you're going to want to sit down for this. So... Um, are you sure you don't want to do this? I, why do I always have to do this stuff? Okay. Um, Joe, so Mary, she's, um, how do I say this? Uh, she's with child, and she says the Holy Ghost is the baby daddy. Uh-oh. <laughs> I mean, like, what are you even supposed to do with that? This is how you know that the Bible is true, because Joseph's first response was not, Well, praise the Lord. I shall be the father of the Christ. Because you would have done what Joseph did. This is how you know it's true because the Bible knows it's outrageous and knows that it's like, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Joseph gets that. It's like, well, all right, then there's only one thing I can do. Because there was going to be an avalanche of public and communal shame that was going to land on Mary and crush her. Because in the ancient Middle Near East, forget it, if you were, if you were engaged and you got pregnant, that would have been bad enough. But imagine being engaged to somebody else and you get pregnant and your fiance is not the father of the baby. Mary's life was going to be ruined by shame. Ruined by it. And so Joseph knew was about to come upon down her. And even though he wanted to do it quietly, that's why he was trying to divorce her. To put social distance between him and what was going to happen to Mary. Joseph's life got ruined in that moment. In a small town where he was living in. Are you, do you really think news wouldn't spread like that? Like wildfire? They didn't even have Facebook and that would have gone around town. It was awful. All was not calm and all was not bright for Joseph. And so last week, we talked about home for Christmas. And we talked about this warm, nostalgic idea of coming home. And all that that means, it fills us with warmth and safety and belonging. How God invites us to come home to him in Christ to redeem us and to adopt us as his sons and daughters. And all of that is true. But we use the metaphor of, I'll be home for Christmas as an illustration. But here's what I know. Not everybody in here wants to be home for Christmas. What if it's not calm and not bright at home? What if the last place you want to be for Christmas is home right now? What if home is a disaster right now? What if home is not safe, not warm, not calm, not bright? 
What if home is filled with conflict and strife and fighting and anger and bitterness and unforgiveness? What if home is filled with hurt and crushing grief? What if home is filled with confusion and pain and anxiety? And I'll, I'll go anywhere but home for Christmas. Now, what we can learn from Joseph's life is a lot from this story. A lot. Because what's true about God, what I've learned as a follower of Jesus, I'm not up here as a salesperson. I'm up here as a satisfied customer. And here's what I know about Jesus, that when my life has gone crazy, when my life is a mess, and you might be feeling like you're not here during Christmas time, you might feel like you're going through hell right now. And if that's you, here's the truth I want you to know. God absolutely has the power to change your circumstances and your life and to move mountains and to part seas and to part ocean. However, the deepest work God wants to do in your life is he has a heart and a desire to come to you and do a change within you that has an eternal time stamp on it compared to coming to you and making changes in your circumstances that are just temporary. Let me say it another way. The change that God often wants to bring to us when life is not calm and is not bright is within us because that has an eternal time on it. And so what I see from this passage in my studies is that God met Joseph and in a moment of power changed three things within him that we can learn from and we can know what's true for Joseph, it's true for us when we encounter God. So here's the first one. If you're taking notes, write this down. If all is not calm and not bright in your life, you need a God who could change your mind. You need a God who could change your mind. Matthew 1.19 says this, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Guys, a huge part of how you grow spiritually and how God wants to move in you when you are just going through the worst moments of your life is often God wants to change how you think and how you see things. Romans 12, 2 says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other parts of the Bible, when God challenges people, says, hey, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are higher than your ways. What he's trying to tell us is because of the sin and brokenness in the world and because of the sin we've committed, the sin that's been committed against us, and because we live in a broken world that breaks us as we go through it, it shatters how we think. And what we need is a God who can meet us in the middle of our pain and suffering and struggles and can exchange lies we're believing for truth. You're not going to grow spiritually unless you learn how to think differently. You're not going to grow spiritually unless you learn how to think differently. And this is a far cry from the power of positive thinking. This is how God works. Um, a great book that's on this is called Changing Your Mind. It's written by our very own community of hopes, Dr. Vic Copan, who here loves Kathy and Vic Copan. Aren't they wonderful? Love them. Love them. We honor Vic and honor his ministry here. One of our favorite pastors and authors, Greg Boyd, says about that book, he says he thinks it's required reading for all followers of Christ, which is pretty cool. And basically, here's what the premise of the book. It's about the Bible brain the brain and spiritual growth and everything we're learning from neurology and from neurological scientific studies is actually confirming everything this book says about the human mind. For instance, when it, uh, you ever heard of the placebo effect? Yeah. So like if you have um, a pill that's filled with nothing, but you give it to somebody and say, hey, your cure for your disease is in here. There's many studies where just by the power of that suggestion, people take it and their diseases go away. Not every time, but there's enough for it to show there's something going on in the human mind. And conversely, there's the same thing true with the nocebo effect. This is what less people have heard of. And that's where somebody accidentally gets misdiagnosed with something. 
and says you're dying of this disease, but they don't actually have the disease, but they end up dying or getting close to death. Isn't that wild? Now, this is all backed by scientific studies and research over and over again. And Vic shows that as an illustration. So listen, what we think has great power over us physically, emotionally, spiritually, all of it, the power of how we think about our lives and our perspective is powerful. And that's why God's so interested in changing how you think. Let me just ask you this question. For those of you, all is not common, all is not bright. Maybe there's some of you who are going, I don't know, I'm having a white Christmas. Great, if life is good, take these notes for later on when you will need it. <laughs> but for those who need it right now, for those of you who need it right now, let me ask you this question. What is it in your mind and how you're thinking about what you're going through that God would want to challenge? That how would God want you to think differently? Maybe it's about some pain that you're facing. How would God want you to think about in the perspective of the pain that you're in? How would God want you to think about for those of you where you're in a horrible conflict and there's a divide and a rift in your family that you don't know how you're going to mend? How does God want you to think about the other people? How does God want you to think about you and the conflict? How does God want you to think about the problem? Or for some, some situation you have going on in your life where you're confused and you don't know what to do and you don't know what decision to make, what? The question for you is how does God think about this? And exposing yourself to this book and letting the Holy Spirit take the mind of God revealed in this to apply it to your mind to rewire and reprogram your brain. So here's the question I'm asking all of you. What current thoughts do you need God to change right now? What thoughts do you need God to change in you right now? Joseph had a change of mind, but Joseph also had a change of heart. If all is not calm or bright, you need a God who has the power to change your heart. Matthew 1.20 says, after he had considered this, the angel, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived is from the Holy Spirit. Underline those words, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Now, what's unique about this passage of Scripture is many times when angels appear to people in the Bible, it terrifies people and it freaks them out. If you think, like, your image of what an angel looks like looks like something that's this tall and it's a baby wearing diapers with rosy cheeks and wings, you've got the wrong picture of angels from the Bible. The right biblical image for an angel from the Bible is think like a holy biker gang with wings who are about to kick some booty and take some names. <laughs> that's what angels are like. And that's why when angels come on the scene everywhere else in scripture, people freak out and angels have to say, don't be afraid. I'm from the Lord. I'm for you, not against you. But notice here with Joseph, he's not afraid of the angel. He's afraid of his situation and his circumstance. He's afraid to take Mary home in his life. And that's what so many of us face. Our hearts have feelings about what we're going through that are destructive, that are hard, and we don't know what to do. We're trapped by internally what's going on within us. And I'm here to tell you today that the God we worship, who's born in a manger, has the power to change hearts. Ezekiel 36, 26 says this, I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit in you. Is anybody here grateful that you don't have to put yourself back together again? But God is the giver of new hearts. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. This is what God does. This is the business of God, new hearts. My favorite story from this verse comes from when I was serving in a campus ministry at Florida State. I was leading a group of college students. And when they weren't busy... Staying up all night long, not sleeping and doing God knows what and cheering for Florida State. They were coming to our campus ministry. And I had a, a group of students who would all sit in a circle, about eight or ten of them, who come to my apartment. And I love to just teach people how to pray and how to talk to God and how to hear God talk back to you. It's just one of my life's passions. And so we're in this group. And at the end of the group, we all go around and start sharing our prayer requests of, hey, um, 
tell us how we can pray for you. And he gets around to this one girl in the group, in the circle, who is new to church and new to our campus ministry. It's kind of college church. She was, you know, new, but really sweet, really kind. And we got to her, how can we pray for you? And she burst into just deep sobbing. Her chest was heaving. And it's just painful to watch. It wasn't cathartic release. It was spilling out from her. And she just wept for minutes. You ever been part of something where somebody just has this outburst of brokenness and it's uncomfortable and nobody knows what to do in the room? And so all my students meant well, but what they tried to do, they tried to start saying things that they thought would make her feel better. Have you ever had anybody try to tell you like pithy religious things that they think are going to make you feel better, but they actually make you feel worse and they're not helping, they're hurting? You ever been through something like that? So all these people are trying to help, but none of it is helping. It's just making things worse. And I'm sitting there going, I'm the leader of the group. And I'm like, ah, we, this, is, I, we, I, I, this is just making things worse. There's nothing for us to do. Nobody could say anything to her. She's inconsolable because she started telling us all about her brokenness, how she felt empty on the inside, how she felt full of depression and despair, and she just didn't know what to do. And so we prayed for her. And so as we began to pray, we just all bowed our heads and started to pray. And I was going to say something, but then a picture popped in my head. A random picture. It was the Wizard of Oz. Like the yellow brick road and everything. Like the poster on the screen. And the first thing that went through my head was, oh, man, I have ADD. <laughs> I tried to get it <laughs> out of my head. And it then came back. Like, the pizza here in Tallahassee is weird. Just get it out of my head. I'm going to try to pray. And then it came back. And no matter how many times I tried to remove it, it always just kept coming back. It just kept coming back. And I began to realize, uh-oh, I think God's trying to tell me something. Because I could feel God's presence on it. And I had no idea what this meant. Oh, what am I even supposed to do with it? And I felt a nudge inside of my heart. It wasn't like words. It just felt like I got pushed inside of me. Like, and you should tell her about it. Like, are you crazy? I'm not telling this girl about the. Here goes nothing. Okay. So, um, so you know, nobody's perfect, right? I might be crazy, you know. Uh, so, um, here goes nothing. I'm about to flush my ministry career down the toilet, and no one's going to come back to my group. I'm going to have to sell vacuum cleaners for the rest of my life. Does the Wizard of Oz mean anything to you? And she burst into tears again. But this time it was different. She had her hand over her mouth, and tears started streaming down her face. It was like she was shocked. Tears just going in between her fingers. And she took a breath, and they began to tell us in church yesterday when the pastor started talking about Ezekiel 36 and how God is the giver of a new heart, all I could think about was I'm the tin man from the Wizard of Oz. I don't have a heart. I'm empty on the inside. And if I only had a heart, if I only had a heart, I'd be okay. If I could only feel again, if I could only not be numb again, if I only had a heart, I could relate. If I only had a heart. And so we paused and said, here's the deal. The God who knows all thoughts and who knows all hearts and who knows you best and loves you most, yes. knows the secrets of your heart and has come here to reveal himself to you to show you that he's better than a Wizard of Oz. You don't need to go on a yellow brick road. He's here in this room to give you a new heart in Jesus' name. And praise God for that. And so here's what you need to hear today. You brought a broken heart in this room, a shattered heart, an angry heart, a lonely heart, a bitter heart, a heart that just feels dead on the inside. You have come to a place where Jesus has come to meet you in love, with love in his eyes and in his heart, to take his heart and go, here, take mine. I can give you a new heart today. Amen. So you need to ask yourself this question. What? Part of your heart do you need God to exchange for you right here, right now? He loves you 
and he will meet you here. Take whatever part of your heart you've got, put it into his hands, and he'll give you a brand new one, and he'll put you back together again. This is who he is. So Joseph had a change of mind and a change of heart, and lastly, he had a change of leadership. Fall is not calm or bright. You need what Joseph needed. You need a change of leadership. Matthew 1, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary home as his wife. Joseph did what the angel commanded him. He changed his plans, his course, and his life's direction. I want to show you guys a picture here. We're in our closing moments here of this message. I want to show you this picture. We went and took our kids to go see Santa this past weekend. Isn't that a beautiful picture? It's our first non-crying Santa Claus picture. <laughs> That's great. Parent achievement unlocked. Yes. Now, what's, what's great about this picture is um, it looks like a pretty picture, but it was not pretty getting there. Any of you had mornings like that where kids are a little misbehaving, trying to do something nice for them, and they lose their ever-living minds? So we, had, we have this phrase in our house where we say, all right, Cade, who's in charge? And Katie will go, oh, mommy and daddy. That's right, bud. Tessa, who's in charge? Tessa, no, Tessa's not. <laughs> so here's what I know from this story, guys. I believe in this moment, Joseph learned who's in charge and who he had to trust as his leader when things are falling apart. You need to know who's in charge and who to put your trust in. Because Joseph learned how to follow God and not himself. Because Joseph agreed to let God lead him. To let God lead his choices, his decisions, his actions, and his priorities. Because Joseph let God be his leader. He is now immortalized with honor as the earthly adoptive father of Jesus. He literally saved Jesus' infant life several times from sure slaughter. And because Joseph let God become the leader of his life, his decisions, and his priorities, he faithfully guided and parented Jesus, this young boy who would grow up to become a man. And because of Joseph's fatherhood and following God and loving Jesus and following him and taking care of him all along the way, Jesus made it to adulthood. Jesus made it to the Jordan River. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. The Holy Spirit fell upon him. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He taught the way of the kingdom. He went to a Roman cross died for the sins of all mankind, and was raised to life for our eternal life. We're here because Joseph followed God. Amen. 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 Every single one of us, we're here because of that. And if it's not bright or calm, you need a leader to teach you how to do life differently. Let me tell you, God loves you. God has a plan for your life. Even when life has fallen apart and you think your life is ruined, God still has a plan. All is not lost. And you need to know that God always knows what to do, even in the biggest mess. He desires to guide you, help you, empower you, encourage you, change you. But you've got to follow. So do, my friends, what Joseph did. Joseph learned to follow someone else, a leader greater and higher than he was. And you should do the same. Pick somebody to follow. Pick Joseph's son, Jesus, the word made flesh. Amen? Amen. I invite you, if you're you're able, would you please stand? (coughs) This is a holy moment. And um, I just want to pray for you. Would you bow your heads? I invite you just right where you're at. Instead of me praying, I want you to pray. And ask this in the silence of your hearts. Invite God to answer this question for you. God, what do you want to change in me? 
pray that now. God, what do you want to change in me? invite you to do something. If you're comfortable as a posture of prayer, would you do this with your hands? Would you like you're lifting something up to God? And what is in your hands now resembles a broken situation you're in. Maybe it's home, maybe it's work, maybe a conflict. Maybe life feels like it's irreparably shattered. Lift all the broken pieces up to God now and to Jesus. Say, God, I give you my broken pieces. Thank you, God. Now is one more posture of prayer. If you're comfortable, you don't have to if you're not comfortable. But if you're willing, would you move your hands from here to put your hands up as a sign of surrender? And now, Jesus, we lift our hands before you and we place our hands upon your nail-scarred hands. Touch every person now with grace to change our perspective. And may our thoughts become your thoughts. Lord, change our thinking and our brokenness and where we find ourselves today. Change our thinking, Lord. Remove lies and replace them with truth. We come against any lies of the enemy in Jesus' name. I cut and break all of them off. Every person here and streaming online in the name of Jesus, we take authority over every lie. Over every lie, we take authority over it and we command it to go to the throne of Jesus where he alone will deal with it and it must go now. Lord, cut off lies and bring truth. Lord, bring new hearts, hearts made of flesh and hearts not made of stone. Even those of us who feel like we would never have a heart ever again in the name of Jesus, new hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we lift our hands to you and surrender. We say you are Lord, you are leader, you are our friend, you are our forgiver. We follow you, we need you. And Lord, for those of us here in this room who just don't need a leader, we need somebody to carry us. Pick them up, lift them up, and carry them through their pain, I pray. Thank you, Lord. We pray all of this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Friends, we're going to have people on either side of the room here love to pray with you. If you're going through anything, come this way and get prayer before you go that way and go out. But otherwise, may God bless you. Merry Christmas. We'll see you next week. Thank you.